AEW Unrestricted, the official podcast of All Elite Wrestling. I am Aubrey Edwards here with my wonderful longtime friend, Tony Schiavone. How you doing, Tony? What's up, Aubrey? How are you? I am doing great. I'm Yay. doing especially great because today our guest is Marina Shafir, who uh, personally I've grown very close to since she joined the AEW family. I'm super happy that you made some time for us. So thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. And yeah, Aubrey, we've had some moments. We, we have, we have, we uh, have speaking really of moments, moments, I want to start this out. Uh, so the first match you had was you and Chris Statlander at uh, dark and mm-hmm. your son was backstage watching and please tell the story about your son's reaction to your match. Um, yeah, so my son was in the back and, um, I lost, uh, which was <laughs> relieving for me, but you know, he is not the biggest fan of losing. He's a very passionate kid, and uh, he threw half. He threw like a water bottle that was half full at the TV and gorilla, and started crying. And when I came into the back, and to you know to hug him, let him know that I was okay, like he was just devastated. He was, bes- like I've never seen him that upset about me wrestling and losing like he was just broken and i was oh my God. yeah it was just one of those scenarios where like people were coming up to like coming up to me and telling me like you did a really good job you did a really good job you know and like just congratulating my effort you know but he doesn't understand it's winning and losing like he's just oh my god he was so upset and uh you know chris being a good sport that she is came up to me and was like your mom did a really good job and he just like looked at her like crazy and then looked at me and then looked down and then was like, my mom's going to choke you out. <laughs> and then just like, like she was just like, okay, I gotta go. Like this, this is where I leave, you know? And wow. he's my big, like he's my biggest fan. And that was very heartwarming for me. Very heartwarming for me to see how much, how passionate he was for me. That is a tremendous story, Marina. I, uh, your, your Twitter description in this order says, Violets, coffee, motherhood, love. Yeah. Yeah. So, violets and coffee. Yes. Do you, do you get more violent when you have coffee or? You know. Or less. I don't really. I think I definitely have much more of an open mind to violence after coffee. Okay. And, um, <laughs> you know, uh coffee just like it's the perfect catalyst for certain emotions and i've gotten to know myself over the years and i uh sometimes just need to get you know take the edge off let my freak flag fly and be a little violent i support it i'm a big uh coffee snob living out in seattle so anytime someone's like just coffee i'm like i got you it's good yeah i i let i let shivani get away with his energy drinks only only because I love him. No one else has an excuse. I, I, I don't get it. You know, I worked for Starbucks for 18 months, oh and now I don't drink coffee at all. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I got weaned off of it, I guess, by brewing it and handing it out every day. I don't know. Speaking of. Oh, there you go. Mm. How about that? There you go. It's my bed day. I went from yeah. training session to training session, so this is like I get to chill in my car. Very cool. And hang out with you chill. fine people. Yeah. Oh, uh, I want to go to the uh, the challenge for Jade Cargill in the TBS title. Yes. Uh, the, the the bump on the table. Oh. <laughs> Just I don't remember thinking. What the oh. hell? Okay, oh. because because that was not in the the middle of the table. No. Like it should be. Mm-hmm. It was on right over the legs. Right over the legs. <laughs> Okay, I know you're. We all know you're tough. We uh, we nobody denies that, but that had to hurt like hell. Uh, it it did. Yeah. It, <laughs> um, it really did. You know, yeah. and uh, I, you know, yeah. God, I have okay. so much respect for Jade. I really do. She just didn't throw me hard enough. <laughs> you know, yeah, yes. She just didn't hurt me, really drive it home. Hurt me That's more, girl. Hurt me more. It was a, it was a very, very good physical matchup that obviously yeah. you guys had worked on, but because it's the first time you'd worked together, right? It was a, it was the first time that we we've 
ever touched. And, you know, I, I just really respect, like, just, I just respect her because she really leans into the things that she is good at. Right. And those things are very strong. Right. Like she's got a six pack mouth and, uh, ugh, you know, an eight pack mentality. Like she gets it done and she knows what the job entails. And there I have a lot of respect for her, but where I, you know, what made it interesting was like, I'm not from there. I'm go- like, I'm coming up through there and she has come from the beginning and, it was nice for us to like have that kind of be the edge about us. And I I really enjoyed putting all that stuff together. And she was very open-minded and professional and, you know, she's just trying to understand this just like everybody else, but she needed to put me through that table. Oh my God. (laughs) Those tables, man, those tables in the women's division are cursed. We have a hard time breaking those tables. (laughs) You know, the medical team came up to me and I was like, we, uh, we are zero and three on the tables. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We are. Uh, yeah. That's that's the record right now. Yeah. Yep. It's uh, it's not good. It's not good, and it almost hurts. It feels like it hurts more when someone gets thrown into the table and it doesn't break. <laughs> oh. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it's. What hurt was going like because I I hit it and I was on like the high side of it. So like when I went over, I bumped my head on the pavement. That that Yikes. hurt. Wow. Yeah. That was like. That caught me for a doozy because mm. she oh. kicked me right before that. And, you know, my soul went out and then right back in. <laughs> that was a, that was a good one. You guys had a great <laughs> match. I love that you're both uh, very strong, hard hitting people, but you also are very loving mothers. I was like, this oh, is just yeah. a great, great mix. And yeah, I, really I love what it's doing for like women's representation. It's like, hey, they said you can be something and we're actually being everything. So, <laughs> hey, everyone, shut the fuck up. Uh, no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no big deal. You're just like Thanks, beating the dude. shit out of someone and then you go home and you have to play with this five-year-old kid who's really into Spider-Man. So, there you go. <laughs> you know what? All it's, right. It's all about balance. It is. It is. Balancing your coffee, your Spider-Man, and your punches in the face. You were released from WWE in June, and then you finally joined us at AEW later that year. Uh, talk about your journey to joining AEW. Like, how did how did that all come about? Because I know we met in October on a meet and greet, and then when yeah. I saw you at Dark, I was like, oh, "Yes!" Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How did that all happen? Um. So I got let go, and you know, I uh, I let my emotions kind of like do their thing there for a minute, and then. Uh, I just tried to get as much work as I could and I tried to land um, any opportunity that, you know, I, that I felt was right for me because this shit has to make sense at this point. I'm sorry. I can't swear. I'm sorry. I forgot. No, um, you can no, swear. You can totally swear. I Fuck can it. swear. You can swear. Okay. So yeah. absolutely. It's it matters. Okay. Amazing. Well, yeah. I did not acknowledge that as enough, enough as I should have, but uh, I just wanted to take every opportunity and understand like what would make sense for me and what didn't make sense for me because you know I did get a lot of experience in NXT and I feel like I was exposed to a lot of people who uh who tried to put like they pushed me to to lean on the psychology of things and like let things make sense and let things make sense and be interesting and that's okay and I there like I just wanted to be able to use that muscle um I got, uh, I was wrestling, uh, for capital wrestling or no championship wrestling Atlanta. And I had met, uh, captain Sean Dean there after one of my matches and, you know, uh, he just, he, he just came up to me with like questions and, and like, you know, very like inquisitive, like he wasn't. He wasn't just somebody that just came up to me and was like, you did so amazing. That was fucking brilliant. <laughs> he just came up to me and he's like, inquisitive, like, hey, um, what do you, like, wh- where were you going with this when you were here? And did it, like, and I've had a lot of experience with, like, coaches and um, just, you know, professionals. And I usually, usually the people who come up to you with questions and are, like, inquisitive about what and why 
something was going on. They're usually like, I don't know, they're better re- receivers of information because then they actually, you know, they, they want to hear the answer and they want to understand. And um, I guess that's why they call him captain. Right. But, um, <laughs> you know, he he extended an invitation to dark and my first dark was Chris and that's how that happened. So, uh, talk about meeting Tony Khan for the first time. Cool. One of the nicest human beings, like one of the nicest human beings in this, in this business. Yeah. Being in the position that he is, you know, he's definitely, definitely not a jerk. Um, he was so welcoming. Like, you know, I got there, he just came up to me and was like, Oh my God, didn't know you were here. Uh, like, uh, like asking me if I want a little bit more time. And I was like, Holy sh- what? Like, so what? Like I, I was in disbelief and I, I hope I wasn't giving him a dirty look because it was mostly like, is this real? Right. Yeah. You know, like I was just kind of like, are you real? Can I poke you? But that was just in my brain. <laughs> and I have to like respond to the person that is in front of me. And I just couldn't believe it because he was just yeah. so incredibly welcoming and, um, I wanted to do very well. Yeah. yeah. He's so unlike anybody who's ever run a wrestling company, right? I mean, mm-hmm. he really is. Yeah, and I haven't yeah. even met half the characters. Shit, I haven't even met, like, point one of the characters in, in like, the the whole United States. I hear there's a lot of very interesting characters, and, and he's already at the top of the list. <laughs> it's crazy. We're talking with Marina Shavir on joining AEW, her amazing son, all of the great things she's talked about so far. Coming up, we're going to talk about training and a little bit more about how she got to this point. Talking with Marina Shafir, and this is AEW Unrestricted, Tony and Aubrey. You came to this country when you're five years old, Marina. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what do you remember about coming to the country? Um, well, you're five. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I get it. You know, you're, you're very young, but whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. Thank you for giving me all that credit. But the brain <laughs> up here has taken quite the walloping over the years. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny. I was actually, we were talking about this at home, just like remembering like childhood. And I was thinking back to like when I was five and I, I have like very like, very vague memories of like when we first were here because it was such a culture shock. Um, at least for my parents too. Like my mom, uh, my mom and my dad immigrated here because, uh, my dad's mom was sick and she wasn't getting like proper care in Moldova. And, um, we came here, I guess, as, technically as like refugees and, okay. uh, we had a, a synagogue sponsor us. And they helped us like get on our feet. They got my mom and my dad like English speaking coaches and um, they helped both of them try and find work. They just put them in the circle, like, you know, just put them in circles of people that could help them. And I just, uh, my mom just had to restart her life at 43, 44 with a Mm -hmm. five year old in a brand new country. And then my middle brother was, um, he was like 10 or 11 and then my oldest brother was 18 but he was in the mob and he went into hiding right before we moved here and um my mom left him left his passport and his ticket with our neighbor and was like if he comes back tell him we're in the united states because she couldn't get a hold of him he was like hiding in romania or something from some just stupid stuff um yeah so like you know she was just really stressed out and um and, uh, you know, it's a whole new world, whole That's new world. And, uh, yeah. I, I just, you never really realize like how extreme those uh, circumstances are until like you look at it. Like if I had to do that right now with Troy, I would like, I would crumble. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, it's... like I would handle it, but I'd be like crying the entire way. <laughs> Right. <laughs> the entire way just like crying and having meltdowns and not knowing what to do and not knowing what resources I have and I don't even speak the language like what yeah yeah obviously a very I strong hope. very strong woman obviously 
Yeah, she just, you know, mom's just, um, I mean, she just doesn't get enough credit. She just doesn't. She works three jobs. She just, she hustles. I mean, moms in general just don't get enough credit for, you know, just doing these sort of things because it's what you need to do for your family. And it's absolutely insane Mm -hmm. what, like, moms are just willing to give up for their kids and give their kids a different life. Like, absolutely insane. Good on your mom. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, it is. Just very grateful for her decision making, you know. So you moved to the country when you're five and then you started training in judo when you were six, because that's the next logical progression of things. <laughs> you know. When like yeah. what, how how did that start? Um, judo was like twenty bucks a month. Oh, and damn. my parents were immigrants. They were my parents were immigrants and they were broke as shit and uh, you know, it was uh 20 bucks a month and I went like a couple times a week it was really close to the house and that's how I uh that's how I came up oh sorry go ahead no go ahead go ahead it was just a hole in the wall it was just like a hole in the wall little judo school and the instructors suck but you know I got the basics of it and then I wanted to elevate Mm -hmm. yeah or at least so you, my dad wanted me to elevate. Okay, so you competed in judo in high school. Were uh, going to the Olympics ever a possibility or a dream for you? Yes. I was, okay. um, as a junior, like uh, when I was 16, 15, uh, 16 or 17, I think I, I think I finally like cracked the top five in like the senior division. And, um, you know, I was starting to understand how to like go up the rankings and under, and I understood like what tournaments mattered. And I, you know, that's actually where like me and Rhonda became really good friends was when I elevated and decided to take judo to like a higher, like a, just a different level and right. approach, you know, just you're in a whole new arena and uh, it's, it was difficult. Um, I was doing well. And then when I, when I, uh, I started to find my groove, uh, I think I just mentally was not taking care of here. Mm-hmm. And I kind of like, I, I hurt my back. I like, uh, I think I, I herniated a disc or, oh no, first I had, I got had like a sciatica nerve thing. And then right after that, I herniated like a disc in my lower back. And I, man, I just use that like such a, like as such a crutch. And I just, that was the reason why I, you know, that was my reason at that time that I didn't want to take the steps forward to like rehab and get back stronger because I didn't really have any, like my passion for it was dimming because I was doing it for like the wrong reason. I was, Mm. you know, and I was failing, like I was in a transition, like where I was, I was getting better, but I was still getting beat and I didn't just crack that little, I didn't stay patient enough to just like crack that growing phase in, in judo. And like, you know, I just made a decision to stop, but I also, my parents were like stressing out with money and there was no sponsorships in judo and traveling every month is expensive. On top of that, getting like top tier training was really expensive. So I had all these reasons, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and then I, I decided to just, I just quit and I took a break from it and I just wanted to experience real life, not understanding that what I was doing was actually like, that's what was teaching me about life was traveling and challenging myself and meeting new people. And, um, you know, I just, my, my perspective was skewed. Didn't have the right people around me. Yeah. <laughs> you you had mentioned a little bit that like your dad was kind of someone who tried to elevate you a little bit. Uh can you talk yeah. about the role that your father played in your athletic career? Oh, he was the main role that played and like I you know, I was thinking about this earlier today, uh, when I was on my way to teach judo. Like he was the reason I learned that just the, the basic concept of, Hey, you can learn some things about yourself doing this. Like that wasn't even, um, like a, like a, like a concept 
in my brain as a kid for like the longest time. And then once he saw my interest and like my ability to do it, he's the reason I, I really understood that and like found reason into doing it for myself. But then, you know, my dad was his own person and he couldn't handle certain things. And like when I would lose a tournament, mm. he wouldn't talk to me. Oh. Yeah. And like there was there was no like, hey, let's talk about this and I want you to be okay with your experience. Because that's that's not how he was raised. Like uh everything was extreme growing up. And Tur- my dad grew up in Turkmenistan and was an only child and like his dad was a military man and like he was strict like there was no fluidity and like um or comfort around like learning losing but when i lost he wouldn't talk to me for a couple of days but then he treated me like i was his daughter after cuz he gets over it cuz he's his own person and i'm just embarrassed and you know he and then he would be my dad like my savior you know and mm-hmm. that's i i just I don't know why I went back to that mentality, but that that's kind of, I don't know. It always just was, it, it's always going to be a part of me because it's a memory of my dad. And like, right. I, um, there's so many good things, but then there's like, there's dark, dark shit, you know? Yeah. And, uh, it's my own personal pain that I've turned into an advantage and right. are trying to, and I don't ever have to like, source this stuff from something that isn't there i know it's there i'm acknowledging that it's there and actually (sighs) performing through it and that lens is helping me understand myself even better so i'm talking with marina shafir uh marina uh i want to kind of go a little bit little direction here because i I know some of your feelings are deep rooted and hey I, i get it uh you mentioned Rhonda, and Rhonda Rousey, uh, you've known for a number of years. You trained together, friendship. She was maid of honor in your wedding. Talk yeah. about your your relationship with her, because obviously it's very close. Oh, man. She's my sweat sister. And she's my, we call, she's like, we call each other electrons next door. Because, you know, uh, we just always find our ways back to each other. Even if we can't, something happens in the world, like where we just are able to reconnect and we like, we need, it's crazy. I don't want to say need each other, but like we have a, a, like a real need to connect with each other. Cause I think it felt like it just really fills. It just fills our cups and it like, I don't know. Like I always feel so much better after hanging out with her and she seems to feel the same way. So we just, keep doing all that um yeah we we've been through some we've been through some crazy things she's been through some crazy things and i've been through some crazy things and we've always managed to stay friends and not judge each other and just support each other and really even now more so than anything being like i'm so overwhelmed and happy for her becoming a mom and because like uh, it's like it's nice to share that with someone that you've already had mm-hmm. to lean on or like you know you've been able to lean on throughout your life and um man she's just been always like something special she's she reminds me a lot of my dad and that's why i guess i don't know and like all the best things with him the uh, uh and i I don't have the timeline right off the top of my head, but did you and Rhonda ever discuss like both of you, like leaving fighting, going to wrestling, like and kind of what that transition was? That was never a conversation, really? but we no, it was uh, so like I had was just coming back from a neck injury and um, and like I I had two herniated discs in my neck, I had like really bad atrophy on my left side. And I was just slowly kind of creeping back into just doing jujitsu tournaments, grappling. And me and Roddy had already been engaged. And um, 
like right literally the week that I was making a decision about having like a comeback fight, I found out that I was pregnant. Hmm. So like talk about real fork in the road. Right. Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, I was terrified. <laughs> I was just terrified. But like after that, she, um, she was just always fully supportive of me. And, you know, I moved to Florida and then she continued her fight career and it went the way that it went. And then she went into the next groove of her life, you know, and I was going on to the next groove of my life, but somehow we're still involved in like the same things and same, there's still like similar circles of people. So we never really had to truly grow apart, even if the circumstances were like, you know, not in our favor. And somehow we just, I don't know, like we just stayed connected and everything kind of happened naturally. When I got offered my NXT contract, you know, it was just a culmination of uh, all of us kind of being in the same area at once. And not us capitalizing on it, somebody else capitalizing on it. Right. Yeah. We're talking to Marina Shafir here on AEW Unrestricted. We have fan questions coming up next. This is AEW Unrestricted, Aubrey and Tony talking to Marina Shafir, wonderful fighter, wonderful person, wonderful wrestler, wonderful mother, wonderful coffee fan. Okay. Stop, talking about stop, lots stop. of different stuff. I know, I know. I'm, I'm always going to put you over. You know that. Uh, Even in the middle of the match. Like, hey, you're doing great. You're doing painful. fucking great. <laughs> hey, Marina, can you, take a, can you take a compliment? Nope. <laughs> nope. Nope. Can't. Anyway, we've got a lot of fan questions for you. So uh, let's just get to it. Daniel San on Twitter asks, how has she been able to adapt to being a professional athlete that also has a young child? This was an uphill battle. Shit. It, you know, you got to like commit. It's just committing to slow as fast in the beginning. Like right after having Troy, everything that I wanted, I, you know, I had so many goals and dreams of doing things, but. I had a hard time walking down the stairs, so we needed to work on that. <laughs> Can't have a hard time walking down the stairs and want to do a bunch of physical shit. So I um, I always stuck to um, Olympic lifting, like, throughout my pregnancy, and that helped me really uh, bounce back with those same movements. I just made them more dynamic, and I had to take it one step at a time, and I had to make sure that I was eating right. I mean, I had to make sure that I was drinking enough water, and um, it was it was a hard adjustment. It was a pretty hard adjustment, but we got there. It's not supposed to be easy, you know. Right. Because it was easy, everybody could do it. Ain't that the truth? Ain't that the truth? And they can't. Uh, All Elite Fair wants to know. My question is exactly how many submission holds, Marina? Do you know? It seems like you bring out a new one every match to bring pain and a tap from your opponent. It's my favorite part of your repertoire. Ah, oh, well, that was very, very nice of you to say. I, I can't give you a number. I can't. Um, I think I have like maybe three or basic ones that I revisit on a constant basis. And then I just branch off of that. So I'll be realistic. I'll say it. I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit here and tell you I know a thousand holds because you know, I want to see somebody do those thousand holds. Uh, right. Great. Every rep. I know like three really solid submissions that I could probably get from anywhere. And four to five, like, yeah, I could probably still get it. <laughs> I like the realism. It's a uh, very just living life in a realistic fashion. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. We got a question from Taco Monster. Do you think some sort of MMA should be taught in high school as an elective? And if it was an elective, do you think students who are unable to travel to a gym or pay for a gym would find it a great opportunity? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So my son goes to Montessori school and it's like chilled and laid back, but it only goes up to middle school because Amy Montessori's uh, philosophy was like, okay, once they go through middle school and they're starting to hit that puberty note, Mm. send them to a farm 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> have them go to a farm. There you and go. Have them work out their hormones on some, you know, haystacks and horse shit. That's what that's what they need. And I that's yeah. what I plan to do with my son. Good, because good job. you know, and then once they're done with that middle school, those middle school years, and I do I would love to be able to like homeschool for those years. And once he's ready for high school, that's when you can let him learn some things. Let him go into a school system and figure that part out. But yeah, I uh what was the question? I was gonna <laughs> rotate this back in somehow. Uh, you think it should be taught in high school? Schools. Yes, absolutely, because you know, people like to talk a lot of shit. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes you might talk shit to the wrong person who doesn't talk, but they actually do. And, you know, it's, it's any, any opportunity to learn and just be a little bit more humble is never a bad thing. Right. You know, uh, as a father of five, uh, middle school sucked. All See? around. I, I don't want to. I just. I just want to be able to just avoid that. Yeah, it just. It was terrible. It's just like you said. The changes the kids go through. It's just. And we had a wonderful experience in elementary school. Wonderful experience in high school. But those middle school years. Terrible. Yikes! So I get you, girl. I get you. Yeah. Uh, the this is from a father Trevino. Do MMA fighters get a say in what music gets played? Do you have a say for your AEW theme? Fighters do get a say for what music is played. Um, I know it also depends on like uh, how they're streamed uh, and if they have to pay. Like, I don't know how those promotions Licensing, work. And, all that kind yeah. Of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But for the most part, they usually get to like they usually get to pick what song they walk out to. And um, I did get a say in my AEW theme music because it needed to be particular. Um, right. When I tap into the problem, like the way I tap into the problem is by violence. When mm. I, my dad trained me, uh, when my dad was training me while I was a teen, we would train in our garage, like the dead of winter, cold. There's a space here. Like imagine a Rocky scene, but like with a little kid and her dad. And, you know, I'm in the garage doing front squats and he's just sitting on his leg sitting on his workbench just like smoking a cigarette and it's like cold as shit in there and he just has classical music playing and you know i'm just like repping out front squats to this to my dad just being like yep push your heels down push okay push explode through the feet like he's just talking to me in russian like guiding me up and down but i just that mentality just something about violent when violence play violence plays like that's just something that happens so perfect. It's one of my favorite themes. I love standing in the ring and hearing it. It's just like, oh, shit's about to get real. This is it's yeah. Going down. I, it just makes me. Uh, it just takes me to the to the other place. Like, yeah. Speaking of your entrance, uh, I found this question really funny. Andy on Twitter asks, "Have you ever considered switching to a zippered hoodie on your entrance?" That is a really good question, and yes, <laughs> I have. <laughs> I have. But there's just something so strike force about my hoodie that I don't know if I want to change it yet. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, like in strike force, the mentality, like, I mean, you're always proving yourself and fighting, but like that the strike force promotion, I never fought for them. I always wish I had. And my best friend did. And like, you know, you're proving a point and Everybody just wore hoodies because zip, zip, zip ones were just a little bit more expensive and everybody was broken. Everybody was fighting for, you know, a zipped hoodie. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's let's go to Wesley Stover. Uh, which the better coffee, Starbucks or Dunkin'? Ooh. Right now it's Starbucks. Gotcha. And if there's no there's Starbucks, time and then place. Yeah, you know, like, you just got to be appreciative of what you can get. Like, this morning I had a 7-Eleven coffee. Right. You know, like, I just... Sometimes you I, just I, want shit coffee. Yeah. And sometimes so, people sometimes people just want to call shit. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Starbucks, Dunkin', okay, they're both good, right? Yeah, they're available. Yeah, right. People are working, they're, making coffee. Right. I'm, exactly. Let's, let's just fucking get one. I don't know. Yeah, Pick one exactly. For me. Right. It's like, uh, it's like iPhone or Droid. 
It's whatever you want. It's not a freaking battle. Jeez. It's not. Right. Yeah. It's whatever you want. I think my answer is whatever airport you're in. If there's Dunkin', you get Dunkin'. If there's Starbucks, right. you get Starbucks. Right. See, that's, that's a really good way of looking at it. Right. Right? It's like, maybe it's just because I've lived on the West Coast my whole life and we don't have Dunkin'. And every time I see it, I'm like, oh, the promised land. This is great. <laughs> Uh, Droopy asks, what was the most difficult part of making the transition from MMA to pro wrestling? My own ego. <laughs> <laughs> uh, learning to swallow that motherfucker was real hard. Still is sometimes. Yeah. Um, it's, a. Uh, you know, I'm starting to realize where the real level, like the real levels of, uh, competitiveness come from in pro wrestling. And, um, I ain't there yet, but I know that. And, uh, my, just being able to sit on my, you know, just being vulnerable, that was hard. It still is hard. It's hard for, you know, it's hard for me in relationships. It's hard for me every, I think it's hard for everybody. And I think in pro wrestling, the biggest transition is understanding how much you need to be vulnerable because you got to know yourself, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and God, I, I think, yeah, you know, I think you fuck those bumps. I don't think you are. <laughs> just, just to throw <laughs> something on that, I think you would agree here. I, I don't think, I don't think you stop learning about yourself. I've learned so right. much about myself here at this advanced age in the last year. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, you just absolutely. Yeah, you learn so much about yourself. Yeah, and it's, uh, you know really understanding that every time you put yourself in that arena like you uh, you you have to be taking like somewhat of a step forward you sure. have to right whichever way you think it is like you really have to and, and that freedom that's difficult because in fighting it's easy like you go into a sparring you go into three rounds if you spar three three minute rounds you will learn a lot about yourself right mm -hmm. and in in nine minutes you can figure out that my conditioning sucks i need to work on my jab i'm definitely like you know i leave this open i need to make sure that i know how to circle this way like you can find out so many things and uh it's not it's a little bit more elusive in pro wrestling because of how you're looking at it Let's uh, let's hit you with the final question uh, to wrap you up wait. this program, and it, it's kind of like not as deep as we've been going, which is fine uh, because we we went, we went kind of deep with Starbucks and Dunkin'. So there you I know, like, <laughs> I just I just can't ask Aubrey. I can't do shallow. It's hard for me. Yeah, I yeah. get it. I get it. Derek Lockwood wants to know what's your go-to movie, TV show, and what's on your music playlist. My go-to movie. Mm -hmm. Well, it it was forgetting Sarah Marshall. Mm. Wow! For like the longest, it was. It's such a good movie. Yeah, it is. You just yeah, it's like one of those movies you have to surrender and laugh to. Um, yeah, that's right. And my my go to show. Uh, as a family, it's been Big City Green. Okay. And mm. on my on my own. Uh, I really, I've really, I've been watching this show on Apple TV called, uh, the, ne uh, the morning show. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, I finished that and, out two seasons. Oh yeah. my God. I am just like, yeah. Pulls you in. Doesn't how is it? not everyone watching this? <laughs> I know it pulls you in. It's a really good show. It really does. Yeah. It's a hell of a ride. It's like my, it's like my go-to every time I go, I save it for when I travel. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, space it out. I know we think of Jennifer, Jennifer Aniston as friends, but to me, she is just remarkable in this, oh. in this role. Just wow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. She's yeah. definitely a, she's man. She's really just let like herself become who she is through this yeah. acting process. And she hasn't like, I don't know. She's okay. just doing stuff that's very honest to her. Sorry. Sure. Mm -hmm. well, that, you know, that's okay. So finally, what's on your music playlist to finish up this Oh, yeah, question. that's right. That was the last question. Shit, I yeah. always banter. That's all right. Um, 
There's a little bit of Rick Ross. There's a little bit yeah. of, uh, you know, Nipsey Hussle. There's, you know, Edith Piaf. Friend, like, there's uh, some Russian music. I'm like into wow. some Russian music, and um, I love a lot of reggae. Um, wow. Okay. Phony people. I got. I don't know. Most deaf black keys. Just, just like a. It's a certain vibe. I like to at least go into before I go into something else. You know what I mean? Yeah, I got you. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I don't think Edith and Rick Ross have ever been mentioned at the same time <laughs> before. It's a good well, combo. I mean, if you ever need to tell of who I am, there you go. Yeah, no, that's that's pretty accurate. <laughs> Uh, Marina, thank you for your time. We appreciate thank it. Thank you great, for having me. This is really yeah. fun. Yeah. Uh, you can follow Marina on Instagram and Twitter at Marina Shafir, at Marina Shafir. You can listen to follow this podcast, which is AW Unrestricted. Uh, wherever you get your Apple or uh, Spotify podcast, it's for free, of course. And you can free. check out the video episodes on YouTube. Just search AW Unrestricted. Aubrey, take it away. Thank you. Including the video episodes on Mondays, you can watch AEW Dark Elevation on Mondays on YouTube and Dark on Tuesdays. You can watch Dynamite on TBS, 8 o'clock, 7 central on Wednesdays, and Rampage on TNT Friday at 10 o'clock, 9 central. This is Aubrey Edwards and Tony Schiavone. Thank you for listening to AEW Unrestricted.